Um, Mark, thank you so much for sparing the time. I mean, you, you've been part of the England setup, so you can give us a really unique insight as a former player and a former coach. What is your reaction to the news that Chris Silverwood uh, has now departed? Well, I think first and foremost, you know, very sad because I know Chris personally. He's a great guy, very personable guy. Um, and, you know, you, you want someone like that to succeed. Um, so to, for him to lose his job um, is a great shame. He's an English coach. And, you know, within English cricket, you know, the ECB have got schemes and uh, are trying to um, help establish and promote uh, good English coaches. Um, so, look, I think first and foremost, it's a great shame. Having said that, um, there was an inevitability about it, purely and simply because of the way uh, things have gone, probably not just the Ashes trip, but wait, before that in the English summer um, with the series lost against New Zealand and India uh, at home, which has been such a fortress uh, playing for England test team playing in home conditions so there were those losses um, and I think probably the manner of the defeat and I think that is where sporting fans they can often take defeat as long as they are seeing some sort of progress or they just get simply beaten by a better side but I think that what we saw was some very confused tactics and selection um, and also the manner of the defeats were so one-sided that really um, it, it, his job has become untenable. <clears throat> do, you, do you feel that because he was coaching in a, in a global pandemic of course you had the, the, the COVID bubbles players having to be rotated so they didn't sort of suffer too much with, with bubble life which we, we know was, was sort of took its toll so do, do you feel that there, there were circumstances there that you know, ultimately really didn't help him do his job? Oh without doubt um, there were mitigating circumstances absolutely um, so we, we should remember that but equally um, the, as I mentioned, some of the tactical and decisions and selection decisions that were uh, responsibilities given to him by Ashley Giles um, so that he had effectively sole power over all of English cricket, both white ball and red ball, you know, th those decisions just did not add up. And it wasn't just one or two people in, in the cricket world sort of thinking, you know, they didn't quite understand it. It was, it was virtually every person I spoke to surrounding the Ashes just could not believe what they were seeing in front of them. So I think that you're right, we should point out mitigating circumstances and the pandemic and the rest and rotation policy, which didn't go down that well. And seemingly, players were rested and rotated to benefit the one-day team, not the test side. And this is where I've got a lot of sympathy for Joe Root, who's been carrying the team on his back. He's been outstanding in his own in individual form. But he's been left in a position without his best side too often. And when you look at that test side in, in Australia, to me... It doesn't have a nucleus, and I think it's been eroded, really, over in recent years. And as such, um, I think they came up against a very good Australian side. But at the start of the series, Australia had doubts about certain players as well, and they had points that we thought England would uh, exploit. Uh, but they didn't manage to do that, uh, England, and they were thoroughly outplayed. But um, I think, as I say, I think you can get outplayed, but it's just the the selection, the tactics, uh, the rest and rotation, too many things just didn't sit right. And, of course, as we know, with the Ashes series being so high profile, there's so much status attached to it. Um, Chris Silver is not the first one to lose his job after an Ashes defeat. No, you're, you're absolutely right. And I think that, you know, g given the, the sort of seismic nature of this Ashes defeat, as you mentioned, everything that is to do with it, not just the scoreline, but everything that was surrounding it. Now we've seen Ashley Giles go and Chris Silver would go. Is there anyone else that needs to sort of shoulder the blame on this one? Or have the ECB sort of now made their decisions and that's it? And Joe Root stays and, and, and we move forward? Well, um, yes. I mean, look, it's a collective responsibility. Of course, players are the ones who cross the white lines um, and, and, you know, they cross the boundary rope and you hope that they go out and perform. You know, the coaching staff will say that they're going to try and prepare those players as best they can so they're clear, they're relaxed and they're focused and they can go over the white line and compete. Um, so, look, I, I think the man to answer that really is Andrew Strauss. Um, look, I'm very pleased that he has stepped in as interim director. I think that's really important. It's a calm, steady hand uh, with experience uh, and also the, the type of stature within the game that he can speak to county chairman he can speak to ECB board. When he walks in a room, people will listen. So I think that's really important. There are several candidates uh, to replace Chris Silverwood 
uh, and to, to, to go into that um, position. I, I think Andrew will look for someone uh, who he can work alongside that will have a vision and a strategy for a way forward whereby the, the one-day cricket and, and test cricket can coexist. And what we want, we want the excitement and, and the, the wonder of, of one-day cricket and the short format has been so successful, it brings in huge crowds, great for the game. Um, but at the same time, we need to look after and nurture uh, test cricket. And so uh, I, I've been disappointed with some of the messaging and language that's come out of the ECB over the last two, three years. Uh, they've been obsessed with the 100 and forced it through. Um, but it's here to stay. Um, but we need to redress, redress that. And I think Andrew Strauss is the right man uh, to, to lead that reset, if you like. Um, and he'll need, I think, some, some people of a similar stature. I would have thought Alex Stewart must come into the frame. He is incredibly patriotic. He's so experienced. He's an excellent man manager. And I thought that, again, he has the stature that when he thinks about a strategy and a vision for English cricket, um, I think people will sit up and listen. Uh, and do you mean Alex Stewart to come in immediately to sort of, let's say, tide us over and, and hold the fort? Or do you mean as a permanent successor to Chris Silverwood? And indeed shouldering both red ball and white ball cricket, or should that role be split? Well, again, um, that, I think it depends on the personnel. I mean, I've always been in favour of, of someone overseeing the whole lot, um, because I think when you split it, you suddenly get into a world of trouble. So, for example, um, Ben Stokes, um, people like Johnny Bairstow, um, people who are playing all formats, who are good cricketers, who can transition well from test cricket and play T20 how do you prioritise different series? And so we've had too much chopping and changing, in my opinion, and the test side has been weakened, as, I, as I've mentioned, and poor old Joe Root has been too often having a weaker team. Now, we just can't afford that. We're not good enough. So that needs to be redressed. I wouldn't look uh, for an interim person. I would go out and get uh, someone. And I'm sure that Andrew Strauss, you know, has been in this position before. He went headhunting for a one-day coach and, and found Trevor Bayliss. Uh, he's been in this position before. He has a great knowledge of, of the cricketing world and he will know the candidates that are available. But I, I would think that Alex Stewart has an excellent knowledge of county cricket. He has an excellent knowledge of the workings of county cricket uh, and dealing with committees and boards. And, and I also think, as I say, he's an excellent man manager. If he walks into a, a dressing room, be it a test match or a one-day game, all the players will listen to him absolutely. He commands... Uh, the respect uh, uh, of all the players. So I think he's an excellent candidate. I'm, I'm not saying that he's going to get the job, but I think someone with his credentials has a very strong, uh, what well, is a very strong candidate. What about other potential candidates, the likes of Mickey Arthur, Justin Langer, Gary Kirsten, who's been so vocal uh, about his desire to, to coach England and has been uh, in, interviews, uh, in interviews for the job in, in years gone by. What do you make of those kind of names, Mark? Well, they're all excellent names, no question about it. I think um, if someone says publicly that they have a strong desire to coach England, well, that's really important because let's not forget, it is a job where you spend a lot of time away from home, perhaps from your family, um, especially if you're doing the, the job that oversees everything, um, both red ball and white ball. So I think someone who really wants it and has a passion for it, I think that's a really important ingredient. Then, of course, you look at their record of developing players, of managing international teams on the world stage uh, in all formats. And so, look, all three of those that you've mentioned are very, very good, clearly. Um, Gary Kirsten uh, has been mentioned. And I, I, think, um, I, I think the relationship between uh, Strauss and the, the, the candidate is very important. And then, of course, that person coming in must have a say on who is the test match captain. Now, uh, Joe Root, I think, is it's ironic. You know, he's had two losing Ashes series, um, been thumped twice, 4 0, and yet um, he, many, many people still think he should be the captain. Um, and his own individual form has been so excellent. And sometimes as a captain, you're only as good as your, as your players that, that walk on, onto the park with you. So I, I feel a lot of sympathy for him. I, I'm not saying that Joe necessarily has been tactically the best captain that we've ever had, 
but I think he has many qualities and attributes um, amongst his peer group to work with an experienced coach and that experienced coach can give him a very firm clear hand guiding hand to improve his own leadership um, because I, I still think that Joe Root is probably the overwhelming favorite to continue um, partly due to lack of other candidates but and I know that's not a, a great reason for him to retain the job but the fact is Joe has incredible passion pride and he's eschewing to play in that side so um, there would there would need to be a conversation and as I say that new person coming into the role will surely want a, 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 a say uh, and to decide really who the leaders are in that dressing room who, are, who is he going to build the team around who's going to be the nucleus in the dressing room and then decide which young players he wants to try and add to the group uh, and develop and it's not going to happen overnight, we know. I mean, even with people like the calibre of Andrew Strauss and Alex Stewart or Gary Kirsten, this is not going to happen overnight. You know, we are, we are in a difficult position and it's going to take some time to rebuild. And I think that I speak about the vision and the strategy. It's how best we can use our domestic competitions to support our international teams.